Now, for those who don't know my name, my name is Javier Costa. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Kenner Campus, and Pastor Manley's out of town, so I'm excited to be hanging with y'all, learning tonight, digging into God's Word. I always just love teaching this class because, uh, because I learn a lot, personally, and God really ministers to me and speaks to me, and so my hope is that we can just learn together tonight as a church family, as brothers and sisters, and we can just encourage one another. So why don't we start the night tonight already? Just why don't you turn to your neighbor and just encourage them right quick, maybe a comp compliment maybe you're with your spouse encourage them pay something to them maybe their hair is looking nice maybe their shoes are looking cool just say just encourage compliment them just make them feel good this is a celebration church i'm just excited about tonight you guys now just a few announcements just a few announcements just for before we kind of, I don't want to forget about it. This weekend, we are meeting where? Poncha Train Center. Some people are like, oh, Poncha Train Center. Yeah, Poncha Train Center this weekend. We will be back at the hotel next weekend. And then a week from today, this is the last class for the Bait of Satan class. A week from today, we're actually going to be having a praise and prayer night. So that's going to be awesome. That's going to be powerful. Make sure you come to that. Uh, come prepared and expecting to just receive and encounter God in a powerful way because I guarantee you he's going to show up and it's going to be awesome. All right, Bait of Satan, week 11 remaining free from unforgiveness. We've been talking about this, this, uh, this idea, this thing of just forgiveness and what Satan uses in our lives to just cause bitterness. And, and when we're offended, how it can completely and totally just change our lives and change the way we look at others and talk to others in a negative, uh, critical way. And so we've been talking about how we can get free from that. And tonight I want to talk a little bit about how we can remain free from unforgiveness. Acts 24, 16 says, And herein do I exercise myself to always have a conscience void of offense toward God and towards men. You know, it takes effort to stay free from offense. It takes work. It's kind of like exercise. What's easier to do? Is it easier to gain weight or to lose it? Some of y'all laughing like, Trust me, I know. I know too. Trust me, trust me. Now, is it easier to work out or to lay out? You know what I'm talking about? Just hop on your which, – which is easier? Laying out, right? Like, you don't want to work out sometimes. Who's got time for that? Who's got the energy for that sometimes? In the same way, it's easier for us to stay offended rather than it is to get out of offense. You see, offense is like unwanted weight. Offense is like unwanted rape. You don't really know sometimes how it got there, but by the time you realize it, it's affected all different kind of areas of your life, right? One day you go try on those pants, your favorite pair of jeans, and they don't fit no more. You know what I'm talking about? Now you got to go spend some money at Target and buy some new pants because... Or one day you have to go from wearing a small to a schmedium. You know what I'm talking about? You can't, you can't rock the small no more. Somehow this unwanted weight just came out. Of, you don't know how. I mean, you're eating the donuts every weekend at church, but you don't really know where the weight came from, right? This is what offense does in our life. It, it causes unwanted weight spiritually. And you, before you can even realize it's there, it's already affected so many different areas of your life. Now, it may seem easier to hold on to offense for many. But what we learned in this class is that when you're offended, you're actually carrying a weight. You're carrying a burden that you're not intended to carry. This weight, though, for a while may not seem too bad. It'll eventually do terrible things. Uh, if you know anything about lifting weights, it's kind of like you, you need a spotter when you lift weights, right? If you go and you're trying to do something heavy, you need someone there to help you. Because at first it may not seem too bad, but eventually if you have no one there to help you and your arms give out, it can be very damaging. I actually uh, spent the day, I didn't spend the whole day, but I spent a little bit of time looking up weightlifting fails. Because I wanted to see what it looked like when someone tried to lift something that they should not be trying to lift on their own. And I actually got a video that I wanted to show you guys. You can play that first video. The up a little bit.
try this at home. <laughs> now, the funniest part, really, that whole video is there's like 30 seconds before where he gets in the video and he's like, 350, no spotter, all day, me, I'm doing this by myself. I don't need nobody. And it's just so funny because then that happens. He's like, don't try. It's the same way, though, guys. In a spiritual sense, many of us today, we're holding on to offense. We're trying to lift this weight that we don't need to be trying to lift, especially on our own. God never created you to carry this kind of weight. You see, when you hold on to unforgiveness, you're retaining. But forgiveness allows you to release. Unforgiveness is retaining while forgiveness is releasing. Tonight, throughout this whole class, God has been speaking to you about different areas where you've been holding on to offense, where you've been holding on to bitterness, and you still have a choice. You have a choice. Am I going to continue to try to lift this by myself only to struggle, only to end up getting injured, only to end up being impacted in a negative way in the long run, or am I going to choose to let go, to let it go, to get rid of this offense in my life. Many Christians today need to release whatever it is that's hurting them because it may not seem very heavy at first, but I want to guarantee you eventually your spirit won't be able to sustain what you've been doing. And in the same way, unless you take care of injuries, offense can cause a lot of uh, negative impacts in the long run as well. I don't know if you've ever been hurt, uh, maybe working out or exercising or you've twisted an ankle. How many of y'all know that ligament or that bone or that muscle is never the same again in the same way when we hold on to offense and we let that weight crush our spirits you never love again in the same way you never trust again in the same way you don't have relationships again in the same way that you once had it when you had a pure love you were able to give that love to people but after you've been offended and now you're holding on to that hurt you're holding on to that injury it's not the same anymore it's time to let go of that. So what are a few practical ways we can escape the trap of unforgiveness in our lives? Well, to release the weight that's been placed on us. The first thing I want to talk about is fasting. At the end of the day, unforgiveness and bitterness is a spiritual thing. And while you can't technically see it, you can see its effects in your life. You may not be able to see bitterness. You may not be able to see unforgiveness, but you can see the effects of it in people's lives. Maybe you know someone who uh, is dealing with this in this area, and now they treat you a little bit differently. Or you knew someone who started going to church and was hurt by a minister or hurt by a pastor, and now whenever they go to any church, they treat the pastors a little differently. It's because there's a spiritual area in their lives where they need to start praying so that God can handle it in a spiritual way. Too many of us are trying to handle it in a fleshly, uh, earthly way. That's not the way it works. Isaiah 58, 6 says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? You see, what fasting is, for those who do not know what fasting is, it's a, it's a spiritual discipline that allows you to pray in a serious way. When you fast for something, it's, you're saying, okay, God, I'm sacrificing something. And so many people either sacrifice food, uh, they might drink only liquids for a few days and say, God, I'm sacrificing these foods so that I can show you how serious I am about whatever it is the situation I'm praying for. And so every time they get a craving for some Canes or some Wendy's or something like that, they choose instead to pray and to seek God and to show God, hey, I'm serious about this. Because when we show God that we're serious about something in prayer, he takes us serious in a supernatural way as well. And so even our church, at the beginning of every year, we do a, a, a time of prayer and fasting. It might be two weeks. It might be 21 days. And many people during this time, they'll eat uh, only vegetables or they'll do just liquids or they'll fast junk food. Um, one of my favorite things to do, me and my wife do every time this comes around, is we fast like TV and social media. And so we get home and we're like, forced to pray and for, forced to talk to one another. You know what I'm talking about? We can't even, like, turn on Netflix or nothing. So it's just an awesome time because now we're showing God, man, I'm so serious about this prayer time, and I'm spending time seeking you, and I love what Isaiah says. He says, man, I, I've chosen to fast like this so that I can loose the bonds of wickedness. 
the chains that hold me down, the things that are tangling me up in life. It's so serious that I have to fast about it, that I have to pray about it. He says to undo the heavy burdens. God, I've been carrying this for so long. It's so heavy. I'm so stuck. It's such a big deal, God, that I have to fast and pray. When's the last time you took something that serious in your prayer life, in your own personal spiritual walk, that you said, God, I'm struggling with this so much. You were honest with yourself enough to say, God, my family, this situation, Father, I need to fast about it. Some of you right now, you're struggling with this area of unforgiveness. And throughout this whole class, you know. Every time Pastor Manley's been talking about something, someone's been popping into your head, or maybe, maybe even during this class, you've seen that person, and you're like, you can't do it. Something is still holding you back. You need to try to fast and to pray so that God can do something supernatural. Just this past week, I had a lady telling me um, that she started praying and fasting, and that she confessed to someone, and they prayed for her about a situation um, where she was her mom brought a boy along who started living in the house and when he lived in the house he was very abusive towards her and so she grew up with that and she never even realized it she's like 50 years old and she heard pastor manley talking about unforgiveness and realized i've been carrying this weight this has been holding me down i have been in chains to this problem and so she started praying about it and and she didn't know what to do she was very bitter towards her mom for even bringing them in and then uh it's just crazy because in a supernatural way once that started to happen she said a week later after sunday morning church her mother called her crying apologizing i don't know why i don't know why i feel this way right now but i'm so sorry for me bringing that man into your life i'm so sorry i allowed him to do the things that he did what, what changed? She started praying. She started fasting. She started seeking the Lord about the situation. And God did a supernatural work. Many of us don't go to the source that we need to go to. We think, man, I got this. I, can hand, I don't need no spot by myself all day. No, you do need someone. And that someone is Jesus. Because he can handle that weight with no problem. He's handled a lot heavier. I want to let you know tonight. If you're dealing with this area, if this is something that you've been going through, begin to fast, begin to pray in every area because God can do some amazing things. Second thing I want to say is to pray for the person. Perhaps someone's offended you. Maybe it's your father, maybe it's your mother, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a stranger that you see on a regular basis. Uh, start praying for them. Matthew 5, says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, isn't this the last thing you want to hear? I mean, imagine being there when Jesus was preaching this. Oh, by the way, uh, the people who hate you, the people who persecute you, the people who go off on you all the time, the people you can't stand to see, you need to bless them. You need to pray for them. You need to seek that God would help them out. That's the last thing. I'm, I'm, I'd be thinking, Jesus, you tripping. Like, what are you talking about? I think you, you got your theology messed up, Jesus. Like, you want me to actually help the people who are hurting me? It doesn't make any sense, but that's just it. Jesus doesn't really make sense. Sometimes you're like, I don't understand it. I don't know why he's doing it, but that's the thing. That's why Jesus works. Jesus works because he he does things in a backwards way that the world says to do. And so Jesus says, you are to pray for those who hurt you. And I don't mean some like lame Rudy Pooh prayer. You ever, you ever read this verse and you're like, great, now I got to pray for someone. And so you start praying for them and you're like, God, if they get hit by a car today, just break one of their legs, Lord, or something like crazy, right? Or you're saying, God, if, uh, if they get struck by lightning, Lord, I pray they make it. I mean, whatever, you know, if you want to strike. You like, you just pray these random things that just don't make sense. Like, God, uh, or, or maybe you, you're a little bit more spiritual, and so you're just like, God bless them. That's it, and you're done. It don't really mean anything. But check out this verse. This verse convicted the mess out of me, y'all. This is Psalms 35. I don't know if you ever read a verse, and you're just like, man, I've been doing it wrong the whole time. <laughs> like, this is how I felt, all right? This is David, uh, um, one of the greatest kings who had ever lived in biblical times, and um. And he was just a man after God's own heart. Look at what it says about, about how he, he prays for his enemies. 
Uh, Psalms 35, it says, malicious witnesses testify against me. They accuse me of crimes I know nothing about. In other words, here are these people. They're blaming me for things I've never done. They're talking about me behind my back. It says they repay me evil for good. I've tried to help them. I've tried to be there for them. I've tried to counsel them. I stayed on the phone with them for like seven hours. I was there for them when they needed me the most. And this is what they do for me. They repay me evil. It says I'm sick with despair. But then look at what it says. Yet when they were ill, I grieved for them. I denied myself by fasting for them, but my prayers returned unanswered. I was sad as though they were my friends or family, as if I were grieving for my own mother. What's David saying here? Here are these people, these people I consider my enemies, but I fasted and prayed for them. Not only did I pray that God would bless them, I mean, I denied the things that I like myself. Some Christians won't fast even for themselves. Here's David fasting for his enemies. And he's praying and it says, I grieved when they were sick. When they were in the hospital, I grieved for them. I I was sad for them. When they passed away, I was like, I lost my own family. Because I I, I prayed, I interceded so much for them. Now, most of us in here will think, man, if one of our enemies goes to the hospital, you rejoicing, right? Praise the Lord, brother. Finally, he got what was coming to him. But David says, no, no, I prayed for them. I sought the Lord. I fasted for them. See, as, you're, as you pray, your prescription starts to change, your spiritual eye prescription. You no longer see them for what they've done to you. You no longer see them for how they've hurt you. You see them for how God sees them. You love them for how God loves them. You know, even with my own father, I remember for so long, whenever I saw him, I didn't consider him my dad. I didn't consider him to, to have any kind of, I, I hated him. I wanted nothing but bad things to happen for him for what he had done to my family, what he had done to me. But then eventually I started praying for him, and I started uh, fasting for him. I did. And I started saying, God, I, I, don't, I, I want you to bless him. And no longer did I, I see him with hatred, but now I saw him with sorrow. Now I saw him with this, man, God, I, I know he doesn't know you. I want him to know you. I want you to bless him in a supernatural way. I want him to know the satisfaction that I've experienced through knowing you. And I began to pray those things for my dad. Until this day, I still pray for him. He's crazy. He's in Honduras with like 17 kids. I don't know. This is what he does. This is my dad. But you know what? I know he's a sinner, just like me. And I've been saved by grace. That's the only difference. And so for you, when you begin to pray for the person who's hurt you, I guarantee you the way you see them will begin to change. The way you feel about them when you see them in the same room will begin to change. Start praying. Tonight, when you go home tonight, think about that person who's offended you. Begin to pray for them by name in a real prayer, a deep prayer, not just a 10-second prayer. No, go deep for them. Pray that God would truly bless them. Third thing is confession. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James makes it clear. Confession brings healing. Letting someone know with the right attitude what they've done to you is very important. You got to talk about it. Whether it's to that person, and and I'll tell you this, don't go to that person in the heat of the moment. Don't go to that person with this attitude of like, well, I'm going to show them. They about to know what's up. I'm about to tell them. And then quote James 5.16 and be like at the end of it, like, well, the Bible said I just had to confess, so here I am telling you. No, come with this attitude. Pray about it first. Talk to your pastor first. Talk to your leader first. Talk to your life group leader first. Talk to someone first so that you will know that you're coming with the right attitude. And confess your sins. Let them know, hey, I'm sorry, but I've been feeling this way. And Pastor Manley's talked about this a lot, right? He's had people come up to him and say, uh, I forgive you. And it's like, for what? I don't even really, you know. But here's the thing. They had to get that off their chest. Why? Because they're the ones who needed healing. You can choose to remain in your hurt, or you can choose to operate in the healing that God has for you. As a Christian, get healed. You'll never function in the way that God created you totally until you're completely healed. You need to experience that healing in your life. I I think about with my own dad. 
I remember when I, uh, I, was, I, he, I was bringing him to the airport, and I knew God told me, you need to confess to him how you've been feeling, and you need to tell him, hey, I forgive you for the things that you've done. And uh, the main thing that God told me was don't have any expectations. And, and you know, I could have gone in there hoping that once I told him what would happen, he would grab me and hold me and, son, I'm sorry, blah, 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 blah and all these things. That I, and I'll never forget. It was very hard to do. Very, very hard because we're driving and I'm arguing with God in my head the whole time. I don't know if you ever done, but I'm just, I'm like, nah, you know what? This ain't the time. I'm going to FaceTime him later and do it. Like, but God was telling me, no, do it right now. And I explained to him and I said, uh, I just want to let you know I forgive you. And I told him why. And he's like, wait, for what? <laughs> that, that was his, he was just like, what, what did I do to you? And I just like, okay, you know, it's fine. I pray for him. And I said, I just want you to know, I want you to know Christ. I want you to know Christ because he saved my life, and I believe he can save your life as well. And he was like, all right, cool. And then that was it, you know. But that's okay. If I would have gone in there with the expectations of he was going to accept Jesus right then and there, which I was hoping he would, and I was praying he would. But, you know, the truth is, at the end of the day, that confession brought healing to me. I needed that more than anything. And now I can operate in healing, and I can do the things that God is calling me to do because I am healed from that. Now, maybe um, I, I want to let you know, because a lot of people sometimes confuse forgiveness with forgetting. You know, people think, well, if I forgive someone, I always have to forget what they've done. Here's the thing. If you're in an abusive relationship and that person has hurt you and they're constantly hurting you, and if you forgive them and get back with them, they're going to keep hurting you. Do you think that's what God wants? Absolutely not. You can't forget those things like that. And so, yes, you forgive them, and yes, you pray for them, but that doesn't mean you got to get back with them. Or even uh, with work, perhaps you hate your boss. You can't stand him, and you know you got to get out of there. The thing is, is, is do you take, some people take this, uh, this idea of forgiveness and say, well, I need to forgive him and stick it out there, and I'm going to be here the rest of my life. Well, they just end up being miserable the rest of their lives because at the end of the day, that person hasn't changed. No, it's time to just forgive them and say, hey, it's time for me to move on. Now, do you move, does you moving on mean you haven't forgiven them? No. You still forgive them. You receive healing from that, and you can talk to them about it, and you can write. I've known people to write letters and different things like that, but it's so important as a Christian for you to be healed. You can't walk around with this hurt anymore because it's going to affect every area of your life. It's going to affect your marriage. It's going to affect the way you treat your kids. It's going to affect the way you treat your friends. Every area, this hurt is affecting you. And so you have to be willing to walk in confession, walk in healing, and to continue to declare forgiveness and freedom. Closing out this whole thing, we're going to talk about re reconciliation. How about reconciliation? Many of us here, we've had unforgiveness in our hearts because of being offended by someone. But let's talk a bit about what to do if you yourself have offended another person. If you are the one who's done something offensive to hurt someone else, and you're not necessarily offended or hurt, but you did something, right? You've hurt them. Well, let's explore what Jesus said in Matthew 5 right here. He says, you have heard what it was said to the people long ago. You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Now, what does God say is the priority here? Is it bringing the gift? No. Is it worshiping God? What's the priority? The priority is reconciliation. That's the priority because he knows that as long as you're dealing with that, your worship and your encounter with the Holy Spirit will be hindered. It won't be as good as it can possibly be because you're dealing with this unforgiveness, this hurt, this offense in your life. Um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I, we got to go out the country. We got to go to Australia, and it was awesome, such a blessing. And one of the coolest things was uh, that weekend, that Sunday, we actually got to go to church together. 
We don't really ever get to just go to church together with no responsibilities, just to be like regular people and just like not have to, she doesn't have to lead worship and I don't have to go do something or be in charge of this other ministry going on. I I was so excited. I can't remember the last time we had gotten to do that. And so I was so happy. I was so excited. And we wake up that morning. We're all happy and it's a nice day. And we end up getting in this ginormous fight. Do y'all know what it was about? I don't know what it was about either. That's the thing. I'm asking. I'm like, I have no idea what we were fighting. I do not know what happened. One second, everything was great. And the next second, like, everything goes downhill. And now we're both offended. And I, I'm saying offensive stuff. I'm being selfish. And things are, we just walking, mad, not saying nothing, trying to catch a bus, miss the bus. Now I'm mad at the bus system of Australia. And now we're catching this taxi, and we get in the taxi, still haven't said a word to each other. Taxi person's probably like, dude, I don't know what's going on with these people. He's like, where y'all going? We're like, uh, church. He's like, Psh. these people probably, these people need that. These heathens up in here, they need, I'm, you know, we're so mad. And, I, and I'm just mad in the car, and then we finally get to church, and we're just about to walk in, and then we start arguing in front of the church. I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, I hope they never Google my name or anything like that. Because here we are arguing in front of the church. And we're like, I'm like, forget it. We got to get in here. It's time to worship. And we go in and we're sitting there and we get our chairs for worship. I'm still mad. I know she's still mad. But the worship comes on. And so, you know, I'm like, this is how my mind thinks. Y'all pray for me. I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show her. I'm about to worship so hard. I'm about to worship so hard. I, I'm going to show her. She thinks, she thinks she got me. She ain't going to affect me today. And so here I am, I'm in church, y'all, mad as could be, hands raised, so excited, jumping up and down, and just crying, like, but out of anger, I'm mad, but it's like, I, and, and the whole time, I'm just, I'm thinking, this ain't about God, this is, this is about my relationship with her, and I'm so mad right now, I'm so offended, and, and I know I offended her, and I know I've said some things, and I know I should apologize, but I don't really want that, I want her to, to apologize to me, I want her to, to at least be as hurt as I am right now, if not more. Once I see that she's more hurt than me, then, then, I, can for, then I can forgive her. Once I see that she's, like, once I see she ain't worshiping no more, yeah, then, then I'll talk to her. Man, that's, you think that's the godly way to handle it? How many of y'all know that's not the godly way to handle it? God was more concerned in that moment for me to, to be reconciled to my wife. I had to take care of this before I could even approach this because here I am now with all the wrong intentions, impure, hurt, faking my way through worship just to make someone else mad. I don't even, and you know what at the end of it all went through my head? I, I just prayed for y'all. I'm like, y'all got to do this every Sunday. Like, Deanna's got to show up to church every Sunday with Chad. I'm like, dude, that's tough. The, de- the devil attacks y'all Sunday mornings. I hear Pastor Manley joke about it. I never realized how serious it was until we, we went together that day. I'm like, bro, that's tough. I'm praying for y'all Sunday mornings. Here's the thing, y'all. God wants you to be reconciled. Now, what is reconciliation? Reconciliation is restoration. Reconciliation is restoration. So how do we go about promoting reconciliation? How do we go about restoring the right relationships, our relationship with others and our relationship with God? Well, first, we must ask forgiveness of the one we've offended. I eventually had to turn to my wife and say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said those things. I shouldn't have said I shouldn't have acted this way. And I, you know, it was one of those things I was so mad. And and here's the thing. Some people hold on to that. Some people never restore that. Some people in marriages, they, they get mad like that, and they never talk about it. They sweep it under the rug. You're going to tell me that that doesn't affect my actions in the future? You think that doesn't affect the way they treat others or treat them in the future or treat their family or treat their kids? It affects all that. All of it is connected. And so I I don't understand how some people continue to walk in hurt. No, you have to walk in healing, and you have to walk in restoration. Romans 14, 19 says, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. See, the issue is many of us, instead of pursuing peace, we pursue more problems. Anybody in here like to fight? You know what I'm talking about? You'd like to have the conflict. Some of y'all don't want to raise your hands. Some husbands in here right now are like, that's you, that's you. I know some people in here love to pursue more problems than they do to pursue peace. 
But God says this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to pursue peace with others. So how do we pursue peace when we're the ones who've offended someone, when you're the one who's hurt someone, when you're the one who said some hurtful things and some messed up things or acted in a certain way or betrayed someone's trust or posted something on Facebook that ended up making a lot of people mad or did anything? What do you do in that situation? Well, Jesus makes it clear. A, it's your responsibility as a Christian to pursue peace. It's not their responsibility to pursue you. That's how a lot of us think, right? We think, well, if they got a problem, tell them come talk to me. I've said it a lot of times. If they got an issue, they can take it up with me. But that's not what God says to do. God says we are to pursue peace. We have to approach the person. Because many times that person only wants to be heard, and they want to know that they've been seen. In other words, that person wants to know that their feelings are validated. You hurt me, and you may not have intended to, but now I'm hurt. Are you going to do anything about it? I can't tell you the number of times I've done something to hurt someone jokingly. And back then I used to think, whatever, that's their problem. I, I do this to even my wife sometimes where I used to joke a lot with her and she would get hurt. And I think, I ain't no big deal. She'll get over it, right? Build a bridge, get over it. Here's a straw, suck it up. Like I would say all these and, and, and but it wasn't right for me. And I remember God began to convict me, and, 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 he, and I would pray about it, and God said, Javi, it's, if it's a big deal to her, it should be a big deal to you. And God said, if it's a big deal to me, it should definitely be a big deal to you. And it's a big deal to me that your wife is hurt, and you're not approaching her to be reconciled. And so now I'm usually always the first one to be like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I didn't mean it. And, and in my mind, I'm like, of course, Javi's thinking, oh, it was a joke, but that doesn't that doesn't mean she's not hurt. That doesn't mean I'm just in the clear because I was joking on my own terms. If you've hurt someone, God makes it clear. You have to go and make it right. If it's a big deal to your brother, if it's a big deal to your sister, if it's a big deal to your spouse, if it's a big deal to your kid, it should be a big deal to you. And you have to go and make it right. Maybe that's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, he says, agree with your adversary quickly. Quickly. Make it right. The ball's in your court. What are you going to do about it? Go and make it right. Now, you may in your heart not agree with all this, but like I said, you got to take care of it. See, pride defends. Pride says, it ain't my fault. I didn't do nothing. That's their problem. But humility agrees and says, you're right. I've acted this way. Please forgive me. That's humility. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. See, godly wisdom and humility is willingness to yield. It's willing to give the right of way to someone so that you can both move forward. You ever come to like a four-way stop? with some other cars, and it's like you let go of the brake, and they let go of the brake at the same time, and you stop, and they stop, and it's like the longest, like, five-minute thing. You're like, all right, hold on. Who's going first? Who's going first? Who's willing to yield is basically what it comes down to, right? Well, in a relationship, are you going to be willing to yield? Are you going to be willing to say, you know what? You're right. You have the right of way. You can go forward so that I can go forward as well. I'm sorry. I messed up. It wasn't my intention to hurt you, but I did. And I'm sorry for that. That's a, that's a hard thing to admit, but it's a powerful thing to say. It brings healing. It's a part of that confession. It yields. It's peaceable. It's humble. See, godly people aren't afraid, afraid to yield or defer to another person's viewpoint as long as it doesn't violate the, the truth. Godly people are more concerned with restoration than retaliation. Godly people are more concerned with restoration than retaliation. Many of us think, like I said, man, let me wait until I retaliate. Let me wait until I hurt them. Then we can be restored. But God says, no, it's restoration. Retaliation is mine. We talked about that last week, right? Revenge is the Lord's. Your job is restoration. Jesus was the greatest example of this. No one should have been more offended than Jesus. But Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still offending God, 
hurting God, rejecting God, ignoring God, sinning against God. While we were still doing that, God chose not to retaliate against us, but he chose instead to die for us so that we could be restored to him. Do you follow Christ's example? This is how Jesus reacted to offense. This particular story really stood out to me. Luke 23 says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified Jesus there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Here's Jesus. People are insulting them, insulting him. People are hurting him. People are rejecting him. People are putting him on the cross so that he could be killed and experience death. And in the midst of all of that, what is Jesus doing? He's forgiving. He's restoring. He's praying for his enemies. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself as if he he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine, vinegar, and said, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, still offending him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. All the way to the very end, Jesus was asking God to forgive those crucifying him. He was even forgiving those around him. Forgiveness, grace, peace restoration, reconciliation. This is what our Jesus is all about. And this is what he wants us to experience as well. This is what he wants you to operate in. Here's the bottom line. As Christians, what we should want is to be like Jesus. We should want to do the things that Jesus did. We should want to say the things that Jesus said. We should want to live as many Christians, many Christ. That, that's who we, we want to be, Jesus to the world. And what did Jesus say? In Matthew 5, he says this. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You know, it doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers or peace getters. Why? Because making something is a lot more difficult than just going out to get it, right? If I was going to have you over to my house and I'm like, I'm going to order pizza. And you said to me, oh, you see, I don't eat any of that uh, ordered pizza stuff. I don't eat Domino's or anything. I, I, I need you to make me a pizza. How am I going to feel about that? <laughs> I'm going to be so aggravated, right? I'm like, this person here, like, what's, what are they? I don't even know how to begin to make a pizza from scratch. Like, what, you want me to flip some dough around? Like, who I look like to you, right? But the thing is, making something is so much harder than just going to the store and getting it. When you get something for the first time and you got to make it and put it together, how hard is that, right? I'm a procrastinator. It takes me forever to get those things done. But here's what Jesus says. He says we are to be peacemakers. Why? Because making peace is a difficult thing. It's not easy. It's not easy to be a peacemaker, but it's who and what God calls us to be. Um, I think a a great example of this is um, the people from um, about a year ago, we saw there's a church in South Carolina that somebody had gone in and um, they they killed about nine people. And um, I, I just, their response to this is such a powerful thing to me. You guys actually go ahead and play that video. Yanka, make sure the volume's up loud, please. I forgive you. You took something very precious away from me. I will never talk to her ever again. I will never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you. You know, I forgive you, my family forgive you. 
but we would like you to take this opportunity to repent. Repent, confess, give your life to the one who matters the most, Christ. We welcome you Wednesday night in our Bible study with open arms. You have killed some of the most beautiful people that I know. Every fiber in my body hurts, but as we say in a Bible study, we enjoyed you, but may God have mercy on you. These people were peacemakers. She said, every fiber, every part of my body hurts saying this right now, but I forgive you. I release this. I'll let it go. Instead of sharing a piece of their mind, they shared the piece of God's heart. They could have gone off on this dude, and he would have deserved it. He went into this church where they welcomed him with open arms, and he chose to open fire and kill nine people. Nine people dead. These are the family of those people. We'll never see them again. We'll never get to hold them again right here on earth. I, I don't know how they did it, but they did. And it's through the power of Christ. A peacemaker will go in love and confront, bringing truth so that the resulting reconciliation will endure. They desire truth, transparency, love, and openness. They want a peace that cannot fail and that's rooted in love. After 11 weeks in this class, my hope is that you'll never fall again for the enemy's tactics of offense and bitterness and unforgiveness. And that instead of being problem makers, you'll be peacemakers. Will you go out and be just like Jesus, a peacemaker in every situation, in every offense, in every hurt? Will you be a restorer rather than a retaliator? I guarantee you, if you have the mentality, everything will be better. There will be healing in your marriage. There will be healing in your family. There will be healing in your relationships. And things will finally get to where God has intended for it to be. Just choose to share peace, the peace of God's heart, instead of a peace of your mind. I close with this, and then we'll be done. Philippians 1.9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God.